Uh, first and foremost, thank you all for attending. I want to say thank you to Dr. Bruni for co-sponsoring uh, this seminar through the Maternal Child Health Transcend Program, uh, as well as the College of Health Solution, in addition to our Center, uh, Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. So it's a uh, honor and a privilege to introduce Dr. Justin Ryder, um, who completed his PhD here four years ago, three years yeah, ago, four. four years ago, I'm not good at math, in physical activity, nutrition, and wellness. Um, and he had the fortunate opportunity to work under an esteemed scientist, uh, Dr. Gabe Scheibe. Um, and he has moved on to way bigger and better things. After graduation, he, uh, uh, after graduation, he did a postdoc with Dr. Aaron Kelly at the University of Minnesota, uh, was funded through the T32 in the School of Public Health, which I think you were also affiliated with when you were at, at University of Minnesota. Um, so very cool, so a lot of connections. Uh, then he went on and got a NHLBI F32, which is another NIH-sponsored um, postdoc grant, and he was fortunate enough to say to the NIH, thanks for your funding, but I'm now moving on to a faculty position. So we actually gave away um, some funding so that he could join the faculty ranks in the School of Medicine and the Department of Pediatrics, where he's an assistant professor in the tenure track uh, in the School of Medicine at the University of Minnesota. He's published uh, 35 peer review publications thus far, which is really good. He's got uh, eight, I think, under review or going to be published here in the, the next uh, few months, we hope. Something like that. Yeah, if he can bribe reviewers a little bit. Um, he's also uh, PI on three uh, grants and co-I on three R01s from NIH. So uh, very much a workhorse when it comes to products and producing. And so one of the things that we'll talk a little bit about is, is you know, what that looks like as a student going into a, a, a trainee role and then to an independent faculty position, uh, where his research is focused on pediatric obesity and specifically the short-term and long-term cardiometabolic effects of, uh, of severe pediatric obesity along with the consequences. Um, and really looking at innovative treatments. Uh, he started out as an exercise physiologist and he no longer believes in exercise. Um, uh, he uh, believes in medication and bariatric surgery. So I hope you guys can poke a lot of fun at him. Um, I jokingly, have a lot of questions. Justin's great to bounce ideas off of. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Ryder, take it away. Thanks. Um, feel free to interrupt me with any questions that you have throughout the talk as long as you keep them focused and short because I tend to talk a lot too, so, um, but you can interrupt me. Uh, thanks for the invite, Gabe, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk with you guys about some of the research that I have been doing and uh, some of the research that we're going to be doing. Just real quick, uh, I have a couple disclosures. One is I'm a drug pusher. Um, uh, so I received drug and placebo support for one of my studies. Uh, they don't pay me, they just give me the drug. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about medications. They're off-label use, so they're not indicated for use in pediatrics. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's talk about pediatric obesity real quick. And I'm sure all of you have seen graphs and figures like this before, but uh, you know we have a, a problem in the US um, and around the world. And these are recent data from NHANES looking at annual trends in obesity in black bars, females and males. And uh, the dotted lines below represent adolescents in class two or three obesity um, or severe obesity. And if we look at just the bottom bars in particular, it equates to about 6% of the US pediatric population age two to 19. Um, and that's around current census data, if you do some rough napkin calculations, around four and a half million kids in the US right now, two to nine, under the age of 19, that have severe obesity. And we would classify that as a BMI above, absolute BMI above 35, or a BMI percentile of 1.2 times the 95th percentile, which is really hard for anybody to grasp their head around. Uh, they're big, okay? Uh, simple enough. So we could think about it in absolute terms, or you could think about it in economic terms. So if we took the kids that just have severe obesity, just severe obesity, and we looked at the lifetime cost of having obesity above that of a normal weight child, and this is data uh, from uh, health economist Finkelstein that was published a few years back, and they, they did their calculations based on obesity, but if we took this and just looked at severe obesity, the lifetime cost is about roughly $85 billion for youth with severe obesity we have in the US right now above that of normal weight children. 
Um, and so that's going to put a burden on our healthcare system. And if we don't come up with solutions on how to prevent this and treat it, um, I would argue treatment when we, when you have 4.4 million kids already with this disease, if you will, um, should be imperative that, uh, we're going to have a big economic burden. And this is probably an uh, underestimate because it's based on youth with obesity, not severe obesity. And I'll show you potentially why that is. The other big problem with obesity is that it tracks really strongly. So this is a paper I'm working on right now from a consortium. Uh, it's called the I3C Consortium. It's seven international sites, five in the U.S., two international sites. Uh, so it's Bogalusa. In the U.S., it's, it's our studies in Minnesota, Bogalusa Heart Study, Muscatine, which comes out of Iowa, the National Children's uh, Health Examination Study, which is based out of Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and Princeton Lipid Study, which is uh, not out of Princeton, New Jersey. It's Princeton, Ohio. Um, but anyways, we've got a large sample size to look at tracking. So we've done this in two ways. So I'm split it by U.S. whites, U.S. blacks. We don't have any other uh, demographics, so we don't have a lot of Latinos because the childhood and adolescent data was collected in the 80s in these studies. And there wasn't, there wasn't the appreciation back then of uh, demographic distributions that there is today. And the top to our childhood data. So these are adolescent or childhood time points measured, children measured BMI, so not self-reported, measured BMIs three to 11 years old. And on the bottom two, it's adolescents measured between 12 and 19. And what we looked at is what was the likelihood of children or adolescents being overweight, normal weight, overweight, or obese when they were adults. So we measured them again when they were 40 years old. This is longitudinal data. For some of these people, it's 40-year longitudinal data. Measured data, not self-report. Our, our sample size for white children is 1,500, so it's a pretty good sample size. And what we were able to observe is that obese children between the ages of 3 and 11, mean was around 7, when they were 40 years old, the likelihood of them remaining obese when they were children was about 80%. Uh, if we go and look at adolescents, we have a sample size of close to 3,000. Um, of those, uh, 250 were obese when they were adolescents, 12 to 19, mean was around 16. And when they were 40 years old, the, uh, it was about 80%. So four out of five obese children will remain as such probably for the remainder of their lives uh, if they're Caucasian. Uh, when we looked at the, uh, our black distribution, which was a smaller percentage of the population, it was even higher. Um, the likelihood of obese black children, whether they were uh, children or adolescents, was about close to 90%. And what this suggests to us is not only is, do we have a high prevalence of obesity, but it tracks strongly from childhood or adolescence into adulthood. Uh, we haven't published this yet because we're also looking at risk factor tracking from childhood to adolescence. We're gonna combine it in one big, hopefully like New England Journal or JAMA paper. Uh, but the sample size here is 7,000 kids. That, uh, and I haven't even shown you the different data that we have uh, from our international sites, the Young Finns um, in Finland, uh, and then a site in Australia. But suffice to say that tracking of obesity is extraordinarily strong. And so, one of the reasons why our group is really interested in this severe obesity group is that when you uh, look at anybody that's not severely obese, um, particularly overweight children and children with class one obesity, uh, they don't all have excess adiposity. So this is a paper that we published a couple years ago using NHANES data. Uh, and what we did is we took NHANES DEXA data from five measurement time periods. So if you've ever looked at NHANES, they measure like 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, they cluster those together. Sample size was around 10,000 uh, kids that had measured BMIs and DEXA scans. And we generated normative curves to identify where excess adiposity might be uh, above and below certain thresholds. So in this, figure we have the 75th percentile, so at the 75th percentile for age and sex in terms of DEXA data uh, uh, for uh, body fat percentage. So they were at the, you know, there were 25% of people were above them, 75% of people were below them. 
We did that for the 85th percentile and the 90th percentile. So uh, we have uh, the ability to categorize the individuals whether or not they had excess adiposity or not based on DEXA data. Uh, this had previously been done in uh, the early 2000s using skinfold data. I would argue that DEXA is a little bit better. And what we observed that is that in males and females, if they have class three obesity, so a BMI above 40, absolute BMI above 40, which you would think that there's not a lot of kids out there with that, but there, there are in this data set, it was uh, about 3%. Um, it doesn't matter how we classified it, whether it's 70 excess adiposity, whether it's 75th percentile, 85th percentile, or 90th percentile, they almost all had excess adiposity. So there are no kids with severe obesity that are being misclassified, as you will. They all are obese, uh, and they all have excess adiposity. If we looked at class two, which is a BMI, uh, absolute BMI of 35 and up, it's pretty much the same message at 75th and 85th percentile. They pretty much all have excess adiposity. If we drop our bar down uh, a, a little bit uh, to the 90th, per, or if we raise the bar a little bit to the 90th percentile, so only saying that the top 10% have excess adiposity, we lose a few. But if you look in overweight and obese, it doesn't matter if you're males or females, there's some variation. So we're misclassifying a large proportion of overweight kids and some kids with class one obesity as being over fat, if you will, having excess adiposity. There's, there's, a good chunk of, there's a good chunk of children that are either overweight or obese that actually uh, are not overweight or obese. They're just being misclassified based on DEXA. So, we, so our group is really focused on these class two and three kids. And the, the, the reason for that being is when you get into those categories, the likelihood of having comorbidities and having actual risk factors for disease is extraordinarily high. So this is data from Teen Labs, which is the largest US-based cohort uh, of, of bariatric surgery, adolescents undergoing bariatric surgery. This is pre-op data, so they haven't had surgery yet. And it's just looking at distribution of comorbidities in this population. The sample size is 242 kids. They all have severe obesity. And in order for them to be indicated to have bariatric surgery, they have to have one comorbidity. Uh, but I think this is a pretty good representation of what you're going to see in terms of a risk factor profile for adolescents with severe obesity. You can see that 75% have dyslipidemia, whether it's elevated triglycerides, elevated LDL, low HDL, they've got some form of that. 60% have sleep apnea, these are from sleep tests. 50% of them report joint pain, 45% have hypertension, back pain uh, from biopsy in this cohort. 37% of them had fatty liver disease, We've got polycystic ovarian disease, chronic kidney disease, 15% uh, or so had type 2 diabetes, and you get the picture. These kids have a high clustering of many serious comorbidities that you don't see until adulthood, but not everybody. Um, to be included in this study, you have to have a comorbidity or a BMI above 40. So there is some variability in, in risk factors, and we'll look at some of that heterogeneity here in a little bit. Uh, you'll see heterogeneity not only in terms of risk factors, but you also see some heterogeneity in terms of treatment response. And so those are comorbidities, but they also, obese kids also have high risk factors for disease. So carotid intima media thickness is thickening of the carotid vessel walls. Um, the higher or the greater the thickness the, is a predictor of cardiovascular endpoints in adults. And we published a paper a couple of years ago um, showing that obese kids had greater thickening of their vessel walls compared to their normal weight and overweight counterparts after adjusting for age, sex, and race. And we also looked at insulin sensitivity measured uh, using a gold standard technique of a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp and showed that uh, kids that were more insulin resistant, so they're low in terms of their uh, MLBM, which is the kind of the output from, from the uh, hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp test. So the, the low kids were the more insulin resistant, high kids, more insulin sensitive, had a uh, greater thickening of their carotid vessel walls. <clears throat> So we're working on a study right now to see, does this track? And one of my collaborators at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, Elaine Urbina, has uh, given me the opportunity to work. She has an R01 that was finished about two or three years ago, and she's 
says to me, I don't have time to write any of my data, including the main aims of the paper, because I'm just too damn busy. Justin, will you do it for me? And I said, sure, you're going to give me five-year longitudinal data. I'll write papers for you all day long. Uh, so she has a sample size of two, uh, 459 kids, three groups, normal weights, obese, and type 2 diabetic kids, equal distribution among the three groups. So there's 150 kids with type 2 diabetes in here which is pretty extraordinary, that they followed for five years. So longitudinal study. We have vascular tests uh, looking at uh, carotid intima media thickness, looking at arterial stiffness. So those are the two variables that I'm going to present here. And we're interested in how well these track and longitudinally. And I think you can see pretty clearly, so this is their baseline visit. And then this, this is five years later, mean age at baseline is around 16. Um, so they're 21 at their follow-up time point. And you can see Normal weight kids, they stay the same, maybe go up a little bit. Obese kids go up a little bit, and the kids with type 2 diabetes go up significantly more. Uh, we, you run your fancy stats and you look at these from a statistical perspective, there's a significant increase in the obese group, significant increase in the type 2 diabetic group. Normal stay the same. The obese kids are worse off than the normal weights. The type 2 diabetics are worse off than the obese kids. But if you look at this also, each little dot represents an individual person. And I think the individual data tells a really interesting story as well. You can't just look at mean data and say, well, type 2 diabetic kids are going to be worse off because it's not true for all of them. Some of them are actually fine. Their vascular structure, their, the thickening of their vessel walls is the same as a normal weight kid. Why is that? I have no idea. Um, and we've tried to look at the risk factor responses, see if some of the risk factors predict, predict progression. The only thing that does is blood pressure. So blood pressure predicts this progression, but anything else, LDL, HDL, you name it, we looked at it, doesn't predict progression. What predicts it is obesity, type 2 diabetes, and blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, not that I, no, no nothing. I'm sure she's got it in our data sets. <clears throat> um, and then so on the right side is arterial stiffness. So it's carotid to femoral pulse wave velocity. So pulse wave velocity is how fast your blood flows from one part of your body to the other. Uh, and the higher your pulse wave velocity is indicative of greater arterial stiffness, which is a predictor of uh, cardiovascular events in adults. And what we showed is that over a five-year period, they're pretty much stable. If you look at it visually on this graph, you can see that they're stable. Again, significant heterogeneity in between individuals. If you run fancy stats, though, there's a difference between the groups. So obese kids have progression over time if you adjust for important confounding variables like age, sex, race, and blood pressure. Same thing in the type 2 diabetics. So there are kids that are getting significantly worse, but on a mean perspective, they stay the same. So what this suggests to me is that uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes are risk factors for progression of cardiovascular disease, but it's not true for everybody. And so we need to understand some of the variability in that response. And it's really difficult to do, um, especially if people only present bar graphs like this idiot a few years ago. All right. And so and then if we look at the heart, obesity and type 2 diabetes impact the heart to a, to a pretty great extent. So this is an interesting study um, that we are actively currently uh, trying to improve upon because there's some limitations of this study. But what they did was they took uh, three groups of kids prospectively. So these were kids that came in for cardiac MRIs uh, for s something else. And they ruled out causes of disease um, so the study wasn't designed to look at differences in cardiac structure and function uh, in these individuals. And so that's one of the limitations of the study. They have uh, healthy kids, obese kids, and obese adolescents with type 2 diabetes. And what they found was from a structural perspective, everybody was pretty much the same except for one thing. I'll go into that. And from a functional perspective, at rest, everybody was pretty much the same. But they noticed that obese kids, and particularly obese kids with type 2 diabetes, had increased myocardial extracellular volumes. So that's what that ECV is. And extracellular volume is a, a thickening of the outer wall, the outermost wall of the heart, and that's a predictor of heart failure. 
Um, so if you look at a 40 year old with early stage heart failure, they have really thick extracellular walls. And if you, if you take this study and you compare it, which is not a really great way to do it, but if you compared it with uh, different other studies uh, that have measured extracellular volume, the adolescents with obesity and type 2 diabetes look very similar from a myocardial extracellular volume perspective to adults with early grade heart failure. Um, and they, sh they were able to show that BMI was a predictor of this. So we're replicating this in some ways in our group right now. We're looking at cardiac structure and function at under resting conditions. Um, but also, I think that uh, resting conditions are not the best way to look at the heart because we're very rarely at rest, right? We exercise, we move. We know that kids have exercise intolerance, especially if they're obese and type two diabetics. So we're also doing exercise in the magnet, looking at same things. So, we're, so even though I don't do exercise studies per se, I do use exercise as a stimulus. So we're doing hand grip exercise in a magnet, look at some of these same properties to look at how diastolic and systolic function might be different in kids that are obese versus kids that are not obese versus, and kids that are obese with fatty liver disease. And so that uh, leads me to the next risk factor that I'm gonna talk about. And when I start talking about my studies that were ongoing, the pharmacotherapy studies, this is really where we're focusing right now um, is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And the reason why we're focusing on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is, um, so this is a proportion of individuals measured by bi biopsy that have fatty liver disease within the severe obese population. So this is again from that teen lab study. And what, we, uh, what they were able to show is that about 60% of kids that have severe obesity from biopsy also have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is characterized by excess uh, adipose or lipid deposition in uh, the liver. And from those kids, from the 60% of kids that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 20% of them have non-alcoholic hepatic steatosis, which is when those lipid droplets that are inside the liver become inflamed and start spitting out all sorts of bad stuff. Um, and so our group's really looking at fatty liver disease because there's no treatment. There's no treatment in adults. And there's no treatment in kids for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And so if we look at, so this is a liver, and this is from biopsy if, on the far right side, uh, you can see all those little lipid droplets, and that's what somebody with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease without the inflammation, what their liver would look like. And so if we assume there's, there's, only, there's a, only a few papers that have done biopsy in adolescents, but we assume that 60 to 80 percent of the severe obesity population will have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, right now, we do our studies not with biopsy, but we use MRI for right around 70%. Uh, so right in that wheelhouse. Um, and this is, a, this is a big problem from a population perspective, because remember back when I was saying we have 4.5 million kids in the US that have severe obesity. So even if we were to take the low number and take 60% have fatty liver disease, so that's roughly 2 million kids in the US right now that have both severe obesity and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There's no treatment for that period. Um, the problem with fatty liver disease is that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, you've got lipid in your liver, relatively benign. It's not going to really do anything. It might exacerbate some, some uh, risk factors for disease, but it's not really gonna do anything to you, but it's progressive in nature. And 20 to 30% of people that have it are going to progress towards NASH, which is the inflammatory form of fatty liver disease. So if we took those 20 million, those 2 million kids with fatty liver disease, and let's just say uh, the low number, assume that 20% of them transition, still have a lot of kids with fatty liver disease, 400,000, right? Of those 400,000 kids, today that have fatty liver disease that will progress to NASH, 20 to 30% of them will pr progress to cirrhosis, which re requires one of two things, you die or you have a liver transplant. So 20, 30% of that, let's say 100,000 kids in the US right now that are e either going to require a liver transplant or they're gonna die because of the disease that they already have right now. Um, and there's no treatment for that. And to me, that is unacceptable. 
The other problem with fatty liver disease is that it perpetuates cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. I'm focused on cardiovascular disease. And um, whether it's mechanistic in nature or it's just an association and it just exacerbates it, we don't quite understand the, the pathophysiology. But this is a study done out of Sam Klein's lab at WashU a number of years ago that we're following up on right now um, using cardiac MRIs. In this study, they use echoes. They show quite clearly that uh, so they have three groups, obese uh, kids with fatty liver disease, obese kids without fatty liver disease, and normal weight or lean kids. And what they showed is that the left ventricular, that the left ventricle doesn't function as well in obese kids, and it functions even worse in obese kids with fatty liver disease. Uh, and it was a pretty clear and consistent message from this study that uh, obesity is bad from a cardiovascular standpoint, and obesity with fatty liver disease is worse. Um, it wasn't a great study because they use echocardiogram. So like I said, we're following up, we're doing a, almost the same study design that we're using MRI, and we're doing that exercise component that I just told you about. So I think it's pretty clear that severe obesity is bad, perpetuates lots of risk factors. <laughs> Fatty liver disease uh, is a problem. So now let's talk about treatment. So what are we gonna do with all these kids that have either severe obesity, obesity, have fatty liver disease, have some cardiovascular dysfunction, because clearly there's enough of them out there where prevention is no longer our goal. Uh, we need to treat the disease. So this is a paper we published over the summer. Um, it's a review paper. Uh, if you're interested in looking at this, um, it's in obesity. Um, and this is where I think we are state of the science wise for treating pediatric severe obesity. So on the, so let me just orient you. So we have uh, a theoretical uh, risk of having a adverse event. So how risky are these uh, treatment options that we have? And then on the y-axis we have what's the likely or expected BMI result. So if we take lifestyle, lifestyle is pretty low risk. Uh, you might hurt your ankle. Uh, you might eat something that, you know, doesn't agree with your stomach. Uh, there is some data from lifestyle interventions that could induce disordered eating. Uh, I would argue with a kid that weighs 400 pounds, it's not, I'm not a behavioral person, but it's not necessarily the worst thing that could happen. Um, but your likelihood of getting any BMI result is pretty low. Uh, most studies, the mean weight loss is right around 1% BMI which is uh, not gonna cut it if you weigh 400 pounds. Just gonna say it, uh, it's just not, it's not doing it for me. Uh, we have pharmacotherapy, which I would argue is very much in its infancy in pediatrics. It's still in its infancy in adults. I'll show you some pretty cool new data that just came out of one adult study uh, that is promising, very promising. But the range uh, for most adolescent pharmacotherapy studies, two to 4% uh, in terms of weight loss means, means. So there is variability within that like we discussed earlier. The lap band procedure, which is a device that's implanted in the stomach, uh, carries some risk more than pharmacotherapy, but less than surgical interventions and shows about 10% weight loss. I would argue though, if you're gonna cut a kid open and put a device on them, uh, you need to be achieving better than 10% weight loss. Otherwise you're just wasting their time and yours and dollars because it's not covered by most insurance. Then we have two bariatric surgery procedures. On the right, we have a ruin y gastric bypass and on the left, we have a vertical sleeve gastroctomy. Uh, when I first started looking at the bariatric surgery literature, ruin Y gastric bypass was pretty much everything that was being done in adolescence, about 80% of the procedures. Now it's about 20% of the procedure. And the field has moved towards the safer version, which is vertical sleeve gastroctomy, which just removes part of the stomach. Uh, so it's a restrictive procedure, but it's not malabsorptive. So you don't get some of the nutritional deficiencies that you would get with ruin Y gastric bypass. They both produce in adolescence, not true in adults, but in adolescence, they both produce about the same amount of weight loss. Um, so on one end, we have surgery, 30% weight loss. And on the other end, we've got pretty much <coughs> nothing from a weight centric perspective. So we have what I call a treatment void. We need therapies that are less invasive, less risky than surgery, one second, uh, but that can produce weight loss that's in the 10, 15, 20% range. Otherwise, we're gonna have two treatment approaches. We're gonna have lifestyle, which is hopefully gonna control risk factors, or we're just gonna have surgery, which 
can do everything. Um, and we need something in the middle for these kids. Yeah. Yeah, so the next slide's a little bit different. Most of these studies are six months, one year. The surgeries uh, are followed out to about five years. Um, yeah. But uh, the, the, the I'll show you some longitudinal surgery data here in a second. We don't have longitudinal lifestyle data really past a year. There's not a lot on that for intensive lifestyle programs in adolescents. Uh, pharmacotherapy, one year's the max. So heterogeneity again is an issue. So we showed I showed you heterogeneity in terms of risk factors. Well, this is heterogeneity and treatment response. Paper we have under review at obesity, combination of my data, my colleague Aaron Kelly's data uh, in pharmacotherapy. Gabe's lifestyle data, and uh, Tom Inge, um, his surgical data. Uh, he's at the University of Colorado. So what we have on the y-axis is percent change in BMI on the left figure. Let's look at the left figure first. It's relative or percent change in BMI. We have three different interventions. In red, we have lifestyle. In gray, we have pharmacotherapy. And in blue, we have bariatric surgery. As you can see, Surgery is all except for one lifestyle person. I don't know where this person came from. Right? Surgery is all the left. So anything below 20% uh, weight loss, it's kind of hard to see, uh, is people with surgery. But the range of surgery is 45% to 10%. So everybody in this study had undergone ruin y gastric bypass, which is the most invasive one with the highest risk. All the same procedure, all the same surgeon, all the same follow-up care time points, and we still have 50% to 10%. That is a wide variation within the same surgical procedure. I mean, their stomachs, and this is one year, uh, follow-up data, one year. So a lot of heterogeneity. And then if you look in the lifestyle and pharmacotherapy, you see what's typical of a lot of these interventions. Some people lose weight, some people stay the same, some people even gain weight on these interventions. That would be you know, this is a pharmacotherapy person. This person to the far right is a pharmacotherapy person. We put on gain 8% of their BMI in a year. They're on drugs. I mean, we removed all the placebo group from this. So uh, we're not going to treat obesity in adults or in kids better until we figure out how to understand this heterogeneity and tailor and individualize and personalize treatment better uh, because this is pervasive. I could do the same thing from pooled studies of adults and I'll show you the same figure. Um, so those of you that are students and if you want a career path, precision medicine approaches for treating obesity or treating risk factors related to obesity uh, is hot, very hot. And if you can start to figure out predictors of response, identify methods of tailoring treatment options or adapting interventions to individuals, you've got a career. Uh, just telling you that up front. Um, and then on the right is blood pressure. And blood pressure, if you could see it clearly, there's really no rhyme or reason with the treatment. Uh, there's a little bit better surgical response, but our biggest loser and our biggest gainer are both sur surgical patients. Um, the mean change in lifestyle and pharmacotherapy was around the same, but you have people that increase their blood pressure by uh, 20 millimeters of mercury and decrease their uh, blood pressure by 50 millimeters of mercury. I would argue that the surgical people had further to go down because uh, they were higher at baseline, but all over the place. And this is true for not only blood pressure, but every risk factor that we measure. Uh, and we present those data in this paper. Hopefully it'll be published soon. You guys will get to read. So let's focus on one intervention mod modality and look at a potential predictor of response. So this is uh, all lifestyle data. Um, and it, it comes from a registry of pediatric weight management participants. This is all kids with severe obesity. They are all in tertiary care pediatric weight management clinics. So this is specialty care. It's not their pediatrician saying you need to eat more fruits and vegetables and go exercise. They work with dietitians. They work with psychologists. They see a provider several times in their first couple months of treatment. Uh, they have exercise physiologists. You get the picture. It's delivered, exercise, uh, delivered lifestyle intervention in the context of a weight management clinic. And we were interested to see if early weight loss predicted 
success at six months and one year post uh, initiation of treatment. So uh, this is a paper that my colleague Amy Gross hopefully will have accepted at uh, Journal of Pediatrics in the next week or so. Um, so what we have on the x-axis is we put people into bins of response at one month. And then on the left, you have response at six months on the y-axis in terms of BMI reduction and uh, percent change in BMI. And on the right, we have percent change uh, at 12 months. And uh, the reason why we did this is we wanna see if early weight loss, so within the first month, predicted long-term weight loss response. But also we wanted to challenge the recommendation uh, that is given out by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which suggests that no matter what, everybody should try lifestyle for three to six months before ramping up treatment. And we thought, and it's not based on any evidence, there's no data to support that, it's just what they felt was right. Um, we thought it was wrong, so we tested the hypothesis that it was wrong. And so uh, what we have on these far two sides is individuals who lose 3% to 4% of their BMI, within a month, four to 5% or greater than 5% of their BMI. These are people that maintained, and these are people that gained. And you have zero, meaning a zero change at six months. Okay? Any questions on it before I orient, I orient you over okay. to the data? It's a little confusing. So each dot represents a person, and then the red bars, the red dots, is mean with error bars. So if we look on the right, what we observed was that if we look at just a three to 4%, uh, if you lose three to 4% of your BMI within one month, the mean change was around 5% at six months, and the mean change was around 3% at, or just, yeah, 3% at one year. So early, and if you lost more weight, you were more likely to lose more weight at six months, and lose more weight at 12 months. So early response to individuals who lost more than 3% of their BMI at one month were more likely to maintain or lose more weight at six months than one year. So early response predicted greater long-term success. But look at that heterogeneity. I mean, I can't even make this stuff up. So uh, at three uh, to 4%, we have at six months, we have some people that so they all lost three to 4% of their BMI. But at six months when we measured them again, some people were back at zero. Some people were down to 15%. What predicts those individuals? I have no idea. We looked at it, couldn't figure it out. Um, but even in this group, so these are people that gained weight. So they gained weight at, from baseline to one month. We still have a good proportion of the individuals at six months that lost weight lost significant amount of weight. I mean, this person lost 12% of their BMI at six months. Heterogeneity in response is it's a problem. But what this did suggest to us is that early success predicts long-term response at six months and 12 months at the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendation of three to six months just to see how it goes is probably flawed. Uh, and that if they don't respond at one or two months, you probably need to rethink your treatment approach add something onto it, ramp it up in some way, intensification of therapy, this wait and see approach is probably not gonna work. So what does work is uh, surgery. So I told you that uh, you know, surgery is the most robust treatment that we have. Uh, there are some negatives of surgery. Um, obviously it's a very invasive, life altering approach, but if, if our goal is to treat severe obesity and our goal is to work with these kids to lose weight, this is what we have. Um, this is a paper that I'm working on right now, but there is variation in response even to surgery. And so this is looking at DEXA data from a Swedish bariatric surgery study. I'm working on it with my colleague, Andy Beamish, who's in the UK. We took their DEXA, their DEXA data that they have at baseline, one year, two year, and five year, 85 adolescents undergoing bariatric surgery at three sites in Sweden, and looked at changes in visceral fat and total fat. And you can see significant reductions in both, right? But there's still variability in response. We've got this kid up here that starts increasing their visceral fat right after one year. 
And we wanted to look at this to see, all right, do we see changes in different adipose tissue depots and is it related to any of the risk factor response? Because if you, if you look at lifestyle interventions or exercise interventions, if you decrease your visceral fat, it's highly associated with changes in risk factors, found nothing. Um, so there's no association between changes in visceral fat and changes in, cardi in cardiometabolic risk factors. Uh, it's just as important as change in BMI. And it could just be that we're hitting them with such a big stick or, you know, they're reducing their BMI by 30%. They're reducing their visceral fat by 50%. Uh, actually, well, yeah, this is 75%. Yeah. But just to make sure I understand the code, the change in visceral fat wasn't independently associated. No, it wasn't associated, period, with change. Really? Yeah. But the change in total fat was associated with change? Change in total fat is associated with insulin. insulin. Only insulin. Yeah, we were kind of blown away. Um, so we thought it'd be some signal. Um, bariatric surgery also reduces inflammatory markers. Uh, so on the left, we have IL-6, which is a marker of inflammation, oxidized LDL, marker of oxidative stress. On the right, we have leptin, um, significant reductions of leptin, almost to the point where, so uh, to orient you on that, that's about what we would see as a normal leptin level for a normal weight child. Uh, and then uh, doubling, more than doubling of adiponectin, which uh, stimulates insulin sensitivity. But one of the questions about surgery is it's sustainable. So do they actually maintain their weight? It's a question that I had. And also are there predictors of individuals that are able to maintain their weight? So this is a study that we published last year in uh, International Journal of Obesity. Uh, from one surgical cohort at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, all of these kids, 52 kids, had ruin y gastric bypass. And we have baseline data, one-year data, and then we also have a follow-up of bariatric surgery. That's what FAPS-5 stands for, follow-up of bariatric surgery, five years later. The mean follow-up time is eight years. The range is five to 12 years. And uh, we saw an overall treatment response at one year, or the nadir for weight loss was about 40% BMI reduction. And then at five years, it was sustained for the most part about a 30% reduction. We also had matched comparator groups at baseline and at this follow-up of bariatric surgery study from a pediatric weight management clinic. These kids were, were matched for age and sex and close for BMI, but not spot on. Uh, but they did not undergo surgery. And you can see that they gained about 10% of their BMI over the same follow-up time period. But we do have this group that gained a significant proportion of their weight. How we classified gainers and maintainers was uh, being within 20% of their initial weight loss. So to be in the maintainer group, you had to be within 20% of your initial weight loss. Uh, so this, we have this group that's gaining a significant proportion of their weight back, and the only difference between gainers and maintainers was quality of life. So the quality of life in the maintainers was better than in the gainers. Now, whether that's mechanistic related or whether that is just a byproduct of the sample, don't know. But this does suggest to me an opportunity. So we have this group that's gaining a significant proportion of their weight back after undergoing an invasive procedure like bariatric surgery. We can do stuff to these people. We could figure out a way to get them back down to their 40%. And so the opportunity for post-surgical interventions using lifestyle after surgery, using pharmacotherapy, or using a combination of the two is a possibility. Nobody's done this. In pediatrics, there's one person, there's people that are adult bariatric surgeons that are doing this in their clinic. If they don't see robust weight loss at six months and one year, they're putting people on drugs. They're not designing studies around this. Nobody's publishing this in the right way. Uh, so there's an opportunity there. And so one opportunity is, but if you're going to use pharmacotherapy, you have to pick the right drug because there's a lot of drugs that their mechanism of action is impacted by the surgery that you're doing. And so one particular drug that we're interested in is fentramine, which is a stimulant. Uh, and we published this paper two years ago looking at a chart review and uh, the blue bar is on kids on fentramine, but also on our standard of care and our weight management clinic. And we saw that they were significantly better, about a 5% weight loss at six months than our kids that just underwent standard of care treatment. So this is gonna help me shift real quick into some of the ongoing fatty liver pharmacotherapy clinical trials that we have ongoing right now at the University of Minnesota. There's two of them. One, uh, so here's the current state of fatty liver treatment. 
lifestyle. This is a study that was done in Norway. Uh, I would argue we can't do any of this in the US because it's just not feasible, practical, cost effective, but they have an inpatient group that they did six months of inpatient treatment. Uh, they took these kids, they put them in a hospital setting Monday through Friday. They were allowed to go home on the weekends, uh, but Monday through Friday in the hospital, exercising every day with an exercise physiologist getting prescribed nutrition, and they only reduce the rate of having fatty liver disease by 40%. I say only reduce, well, if I'm gonna put somebody in an inpatient setting for six months, I better be about 100% effective. Otherwise, it's just not working. They're, I mean, they're hitting them with the biggest hammer that they probably could. They did the same thing with an ambulatory care group who went to the hospital for exercise and nutrition guidance three days a week for six months. They got about the same response. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to treat fatty liver disease. Don't quite know why. Uh, there's a uh, group called the NASH Consortium that had this really cool idea of this adiponectin multimer, multimer called cysteine bitterate. And this animal studies showed that it might be effective for treatment. And even though we, they saw reductions in ALT when they looked at their primary efficacy endpoint, which was biopsy, showed no change at one year in adolescence with biopsies at baseline and at one year. I would argue if you're gonna put kids through having two biopsies and include them to be in a study, better be damn sure that your treatment's gonna be effective because that's pretty invasive. There is some hope though from the adult world uh, that pioglitazone, which is a T TZD, um, causes weight gain. So the individuals on treatment gained about one kilo throughout this whole trial. However, they saw significant reductions in liver triglyceride content improvements in hepatic insulin sensitivity. And when they looked at their goal, the gold standard endpoint, which is uh, liver biopsy, significant improvements in the drug group versus uh, the placebo group. So there is some hope for pharmacotherapy. So right now, uh, in Minnesota, we have a, a trial looking at a, a glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist. Uh, it's an injectable drug once weekly. Kids take this, they don't have a problem with it. Um, and what it does is what GLP-1s do is they work on the gut-brain axis and they basically send help. Uh, so GLP-1 is produced in the intestines and it helps with uh, signaling the brain that you're full or that a meal has been offloaded, okay? And so when you give them a receptor agonist, it stimulates that without a meal being uh, present, sends a signal to the brain. Brain says that we're full and satiated. A colleague, Aaron Kelly, published this paper a couple years ago showing that uh, in the, the red group, these are kids on GLP-1s for six months, significant reduction from placebo. But then we also always have this placebo outlier, the best kid in four months with a placebo kid who lost 8% of their BMI, messing up the data. Uh, but GLP-1s also work on the liver. So there's a GLP-1 receptor in the liver. If you stimulate it using a GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, inhibits or upregulates AMP kinase, which would inhibit de novo lipogenesis. So we thought, let's lever, measure liver fat in these. And then while we were designing this, there were a couple of studies that came out on the same GLP-1 receptor agonist that we're using, showing significant reductions post-treatment on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So this is ongoing, but there's two components to the study. And one of them, I can actually show you some real data. Um, so uh, there's two phases to the study. One is a meal replacement induction period. So we designed this as a weight loss maintenance study. So can we get kids to lose weight? And can we use the drug as an adjunct to help them maintain their body weight? And so we put them on meal replacements for six to eight weeks, and their goal is to lose 5% of their BMI. If they don't lose 5% of their BMI, we kick them out of the study. So they have to meet that goal. About 70, 75% are able to meet that goal. And then we randomized them to drug or placebo for, six, uh, for, for 12 months, measure them again at six months and 12 months. I can't show you that data because it's blinded. Um, and so I just can't show it to you. Uh, we'll be fully enrolled by December of this year. Uh, so hope to be unblinded by December, or January next year, and hopefully have some interesting data. Well, what I can show you is our pre-post meal replacement period. So these are all kids who lost 5% of their BMI we selected 20 of them. Um, so you can see the BMI reduction uh, is around 5%, it's like 5.8%. Uh, measured a whole lot of stuff, but we also measured hepatic fat fraction. 
Uh, I'll show you what it looks like in a figure form. I think it's better. So mean is right around 10% post weight loss. So six to eight weeks later, we get a reduction in hepatic fat fraction measured by MRI. The relative amount is close to 30%, but you can see some individual variation in response. So if you were the 10 kids that didn't have fatty liver disease, so how we define it is hepatic fat fraction above 5.5%. If you were the kids that were below that threshold, which is 10 of them, it stayed right where you are. Uh, it's almost linear for every single person that's in that group, which is pretty remarkable. But if you were the 10 that were above, say for one soul, they decreased their liver fat substantially. Then we got this one kid who's messing up my data, making it not look as pretty as it should, and increased their liver fat over time, despite losing 5% of their body weight. So heterogeneity it exists and it's troublesome. But the cool thing about this is it's twofold. So we had two kids that went from having fatty liver disease to not having fatty liver disease defined by MRI, uh, which has some limitations that I don't have time to go into. But the majority of the kids still have fatty liver disease despite losing 5% of their BMI. So hopefully when we put them on drug six months, 12 months, some of the kids will have gone lower, hopefully. Maybe they'll have lost weight. Maybe the drug's mechanism, mechanism of action will have worked. Uh, this is N of 20. We now have this on about 40 pre-post. I just haven't had time to mess with the data. And we have uh, quite a range of liver fat values from the 1% here all the way up to close to 50%. Our, bigger, our biggest fat liver is 48% so far. So there's hope for GLP-1s. And so this is an adult study that came out recently. Um, new GLP-1 receptor agonists just completed their phase two obesity trial. And at one year on the high dose of this drug called semaglutide, made by Novo Nordisk, they showed 16% weight loss in the adults with the high group. Remember that treatment void that I showed you? I said that where, where we want to get is these less invasive treatments that are about 15 to 20% at middle ground. This is potentially where we're at. If it, if it shows to be successful in phase three trials, it's a game changer for pharmacotherapy. So the new study that we just got FDA approved two weeks ago um, is looking at a drug called a sodium glucose-like co-transporter 2 or SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2s work on the, on the kidney. Uh, SGLT2 uh, is expressed exclusively in the kidney and it regulates about 90% of glucose reabsorption in the kidney. If you inhibit SGLT2s using SGLT2 inhibitor, you reduce glucose reabsorption in the kidney by 40 to 50%. And what this causes is glucosiuria, so excreting glucose out in the urine to the tune of adults with type 2 diabetes of 50 to 100 kcals a day, uh, or grams a day, which is around you know, three, 250 to 400 kcals a day of glucose just being peed out. Uh, so it's FDA approved in adults for treating type 2 diabetes and has a secondary indication for reducing cardiovascular events in adults with type 2 diabetes. We're going a little bit long, so I'm not gonna show you any of the pathophysiology data uh, on why this works, but it causes a little bit of weight loss, not as much as you would expect on the right. Um, so we think it might be a potentially successful treatment for fatty liver disease. And the reason for that being is uh, it works on multiple physiological mechanisms. So when you pee out glucose, you lower systemic glucose, you lower systemic insulin levels. But you also with the drug get about a threefold increase in glucagon. What that glucagon does is it works on the liver to increase hepatic gluconeogenesis. So it lowers glucose systemically, but then your liver goes into overdrive and starts ramping up production of glucose. And so what that potentially could do is shift the liver from instead of glucose utilization uh, to, to glucose production, and then you would inhibit potentially de novo lipogenesis and shift towards a phase where you're utilizing that fat that's been stored in the liver. It's been successfully shown in eight or nine animal studies that that's, that's actually how it works. And so you inhibit, uh, you, you, get, you cause glucosuria, you get this increase in hepatic gluconeogenesis, and the liver fat falls in these rats, uh, even with only like two to 3% weight loss. So it's not a weight driven mechanism. So we just got FDA approval two weeks ago 
to do a first in pediatrics clinical trial using a SGLT2 inhibitor. Um, it'll be, the inclusion criteria will, will be that they have to have a hepatic fat fraction above 5.5%, so that red bar that I showed you, you don't want any of the kids that are below that because they're uh, gonna be pretty stable, so they have to have fatty liver disease. They have to have elevated ALTs, and the FDA mandated that we include an ultrasound or biopsy diagnosis of fatty liver disease. Makes it a little bit harder for us to enroll the study, but uh, we think it'll be a cleaner design and they think it'll be safer. Uh, they just have to have obesity, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, nope. Not possible risk of yeah, so we have a lot of safety endpoints. Since it's a first in pediatrics trial, our primary focus is actually safety. Because uh, if, if you don't show that it's safe, it doesn't matter if it's effective, right? So we have lots of safety measures, um, whether it's uh, looking at bone biomarkers. Uh, the, the primary uh, risk with taking this drug is in females is uh, general mycotic infections and uh, uh, urinary tract infections. Um, but that's because this has never been done in a longer than two weeks in a non-diabetic population. So um, the type two diabetics have higher risk for that anyways. And then you're giving them a drug that makes them pee out glucose and makes it a rich environment for infection, for bacterial infections. But good question. Uh, BMI percentile of 95th and up. So, uh, so it's not exclusive to severe obesity. And the reason for that being is that 35% of the obese pediatric population has fatty liver disease. And if we, we structured our inclusion exclusion criteria in such a way that we can be inclusive to kids at lower BMIs, um, 12 to 17 year olds, and we wanted to target non-diabetics. So it's approved for adults with type two diabetes, but there is data to show that if you give a normal glucose tolerant person, an SGLT2 inhibitor, the same mechanism of action works. They still get glucosuria. So we wanted to test this in normal fasting glucose individuals because most adolescents, 90, 95% of them, especially in Minnesota where they're all white, uh, will have normal fasting glucose. And so we want it to be clinically practical. Uh, they have to be post-pubertal, so Tanner stage two and up, and then we measure uh, filtration rate in the kidneys and it'll be above 90. It'll be 20 kids on drug, 20 kids on placebo, and we have lots of outcome measures because nobody's done this in kids. We wanna throw as many measures as we possibly can at them even though our primary outcome measures hepatic fat content, we don't want to waste our time and money because uh, backstory for all of you students, if you're interested in you know, pursuing science, these studies can take a really long time. I submitted my first grant of this three and a half years ago. Uh, and I'm finally getting to the point where I'm going to start enrolling our first patients in January. Uh, so it's been about a four year process since I had the first conversation with somebody about this. It takes a long time and I don't want to mess it up. So. Uh, doing oral glucose tolerance tests. We're gonna do continuous glucose monitors, DEXA, arterial stiffness measures, a whole smorgasbord of uh, safety measures, uh, some mandated by the FDA, some not, other biomarkers and some uh, genetic markers. And two days after we got FDA approval, Diabetes Care published this paper showing that SGLT2 inhibitors, very similar design, six months, ends of 20 in both group empagliflozin, which is a SGLT2 inhibitor in a Indians uh, from India, the country, not Native Americans, uh, showed a significant reduction in liver fat measured by MRI. Uh, it's about a 40% reduction in liver fat on SGLT2 inhibitors. And I'll skip this last slide. Uh, so I showed you a lot of work. A lot of it comes from a lot of funding. Some, most of it I didn't obtain. So I'd like to thank the funders of this. Um, and my mentors and collaborators, multiple institution, a lot of people have taken a lot of time to help me develop my career and uh, let me use their data. I was telling Gabe's postdoc, Erica, earlier that I don't think since I've been here that I've published a single paper from data that I've collected on my own, um, which is okay, it's totally fine because I'm collecting data now, eventually I'll publish my own stuff, but it's okay to publish other people's stuff. And questions. Uh, so it's a six-month study. So we'll take them off at, at six months. 
Uh, so right now, SGLT2 inhibitors are used as a second line treatment. So after metformin, if metformin is unsuccessful at controlling um, type 2 diabetes, but sometimes with insulin, uh, it's not, most people don't use it as a first line therapy, but uh, think about obesity like you think about diabetes as a chronic disease. If you're going to put them on a drug, they should probably be on it for the rest of their lives because it's working on their biology, right? So same thing, I, I view obesity just like you view diabetes, hypertension. You put them on a drug because you're treating the disease, not they lost 50 pounds, so we can take it off. Because what's gonna happen, they can go right back up. What's the, the recommendation or prescription? Once they get done with surgery on the way out of the hospital, what do they tell them after that? So, depends um, on where, where who, who's doing the surgery. Uh, surgeons typically address post-surgical complications and want to make sure that the surgery is fine. After three or six months, they most surgeons, not all surgeons, most surgeons, don't ever see the patients ever again. Uh, recommendations are typically nutritional in nature and they're mostly recommended so that they don't have adverse events like expanding the pouch and um, uh, blowing out their sutures and things like that, but it's low food intake, pretty much. So I'm just thinking, do you think the reason for the heterogeneity is just the fact that they're all going and living a very different life without that? It could be. Could be that. Could be genetics. It could be, like I said, it's all the same surgeon, all the same site. The procedure is the same. The size of their stomach at the end is the same. Um, some of them started at higher BMIs, and so they're likely to have a bigger reduction. Because um, if you have more to lose, you typically lose more. I don't know. I don't know what's causing the heterogeneity. It's a ripe area for research, though. Okay, probably one more question, and then uh, yeah. you can stick around. Yeah, I can stick around for questions as long as you guys want. Yeah. Um, on, when you were talking about the, the cardiac MRI data and mm -hmm. So that was somebody else's study, okay. and we're doing we're doing full maps in, in our hearts okay. now. Um, so we just finished. We're about two thirds of the way through, okay. so it's not ready to show anybody yet. All right, guys, let's uh, take a break. Thank Justin Ryder for his presentation. <laughs>